This first gentleman is a 40-year-old uh, man who was brought uh, to our hospital after a rollover MVC off a 20-foot bridge. He came in unable to move his legs. Uh, he had no significant uh, prior medical history. Uh, his examination, he had uh, a step off and some point tenderness uh, that could be felt in his thoracolumbar junction. He had no motor uh, activity in the lower extremities. He had uh, high suspicion for uh, spinal shock. He had a, a depressed reflexes and an absent uh, bulbo cavernous reflex without any rectal tone. And here was his uh, sagittal CT that shows a pretty severe comminuted L1 burst fracture uh, with disruption of the posterior elements, uh, some small splaying between the T12 and the uh, L1 uh, spinous processes and, and clear massive canal compromise, as well vir as virtually a complete coronal split uh, down the middle of the body. And when we look at the axials, this is uh, somewhat we expect to see after seeing the sagittals, the, nearly the entire canal is obliterated by bone fragments um, at the L1 body itself. The facet joint is disrupted and uh, at the level below at L12, he's essentially dislocated his facet joint. Uh, we were able to obtain a uh, expeditious MRI in this patient, uh, and this highlights certainly what we would expect to find. He has severe compression of his spinal cord uh, at the level of uh, the conus. Here's our axial images uh, in T2, barely able to discern his spinal canal here at the L1 level and uh, just adjacent uh, at L1-2 with the uh, facet joint splaying here. So uh, the diagnosis always uh, comes first. So in this gentleman, this was a uh, L1 burst fracture with uh, a incomplete uh, spinal cord injury at a spinal epidural hematoma uh, as well, and uh, the diagnosis of spinal shock. And so uh, as Dr. Snyder highlighted, there are a number of classification systems that can be useful um, not only in management, but really in communicating provider to provider and for the purposes of large scale studies to be able to classify this. I think most uh, spine surgeons would look at this and consider this operative uh, just with the eyeball test, but it's worthwhile for the, uh, for the practice just to go through more specifically how we classify this. So uh, this was a uh, burst fracture. Um, there was not translation or subluxation per se. So we scored this a uh, two points uh, for his injury morphology. Uh, I think it was pretty clear both from the CT and as well confirmed technically with the MRI that the posterior ligamentous complex uh, was injured and disrupted, so three points. And then neurologic status, uh, three points for an incomplete uh, spinal cord injury. So as the TLIC score tells us, uh, favorable for operative intervention over a four. Certainly this is well over that and uh, should receive surgery. The AO classification, I won't uh, belabor going through all this uh, on the AO score of a 10. It was a B2 fracture uh, at that L1 level. So uh, the operative options here are bountiful. Um, and uh, as we saw, the, the data guiding this is not entirely convincing for one approach versus the other. In theory, uh, this could be done through a minimally invasive approach or an open approach. Could it be done with fixation uh, with arthrodesis or is, is fusion not necessary? And even beyond the structural and uh, technical considerations, uh, the approach considerations. Uh, it's fallen out of favor with advances in a lot of the instrumentation, but traditionally a lot of these would be treated uh, with an anterior approach for anterior column reconstruction and decompression, or posterior approach uh, is common, or a combined approach. And I think uh, one can make an argument in this case for uh, many of these. But when we look at the CNS guidelines uh, data that Dr. Snyder alluded to for uh, critical evaluation of surgical approaches, on uh, the table here in table one to the left of the screen, uh, there were a few studies that really showed no, dif no difference in outcomes. They're all evidence level twos and threes, essentially, uh, showing no difference favoring an anterior or posterior approach. When we looked at a uh, combined approach or anterior and posterior versus simply a posterior approach, uh, 
Uh, there was one study that favored posterior, but the vast majority really showed no difference. So um, I think this really is determined based on the clinical considerations, the age of the patient, uh, distracting injuries, uh, the ability to maintain the patient safely in the operating room for an extended period of time, as well as the concerns for progressive deformity. And certainly at the thoracolumbar junction, I think that's uh, quite important where the mobile lumbar spine meets the more fixed thoracic spine. So for this gentleman, um, we started with a posterior instrument effusion and a decompression. Uh, and we tried to tamp in the fracture fragment to better decompress the spinal canal uh, in hopes of uh, preventing any secondary neurologic uh, deterioration. Here was his intraoperative fluoroscopy pictures that show at least uh, a return of his normal alignment when uh, positioned properly on the table. And we went, given the uh, junctional level as well as the violence of the injury itself, uh, we decided to extend this uh, three levels up and down from the fractured level with screws and a posterolateral arthrodesis. And during surgery, we attempted to push down the fracture fragment uh, from the ventral canal. Here's a picture of the uh, Woodson elevator trying to, trying to push this down. And uh, my experience at least has been, it, it feels more satisfying than it looks on post-operative uh, post imaging. Occasionally I'll use the ultrasound to uh, try to visualize where the fragment is uh, the most compressive uh, through the canal and through the cord itself. And on the post-operative CT scan, I think we had a uh, very good alignment, but uh, still his canal was, was severely compromised and having tried pretty extensively to do this from a posterior approach, I felt this was appropriate to consider a staged, uh, second stage anterior approach the next day to not only decompress the ventral canal, but also to uh, perform additional anterior column support. And this was done with an expandable uh, titanium cage. And then uh, a plate can be used or integrated screws. In this case, we used uh, pedicle screws with a small washer to provide orthogonal fixation in both the sagittal and uh, coronal planes to increase the stiffness of the construct. And here was our uh, final x-rays. At uh, six months, uh, this gentleman, his back pain resolved. His lower extremity uh, dysesthesias had improved, but were still certainly present. He regained bowel continence and was able to uh, urinate. He still had pretty severe weakness in the left leg and in the right leg uh, to a lesser degree. But overall, his, um, his construct appeared to be holding well. And I think it highlights this could be done truly posterior. This, you know, an argument could be made to do this anteriorly with a small posterior fusion. And I think that's the um, interesting part of managing these patients is that there are a lot of options and uh, a lot of different techniques you can use to uh, obtain the same outcomes.